Kia ora koutou katoa and welcome to our SSPP Assessment Task 8 tutorial, which is our Dorothy case study. So um, it's lovely to have you join us and I'm very excited because I'm sitting here next to uh, my colleague and my very good friend, Mr. Grant Hocking. Kia ora Grant, how are you? Kia ora Edward, I'm very good. Kia ora everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really good. I'm getting ready to go home soon. Oh, so. wow. Okay, even, 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 even better. Mm. Okay, well, let's rock on with this. So, um, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the way the task tutorials work by now. So, uh, this is task tutorial eight, which is a case study around Dorothy. So, if you uh, the unit standards it covers. So, the, this one, this you, you complete this SSPP for Stop Smoking Practitioner Program assessment task and by doing that, you achieve two unit standards. So at level three, so there's three credits for the first and five for the second unit standard, so eight credits. And um, it's about recognizing and describing responses to vulnerability and abuse in the health or wellbeing setting. And also, there's um, the second unit standard covers factors that contribute to mental health, wellbeing, and mental health. Problems. So, really important stuff to know when you're working with your communities to um, as a, as health professionals. Nice. Okay. So the best enough for this task is that uh, you to be recognising indicators of abuse and uh, what you might do when you're responding to the suspected abuse and um, factors that contribute to people when they're vulnerable and increase the likelihood of harm and abuse. So that's what this task rationale is about. And it's really important for um, community health professionals who are often visiting people in their home or meeting with people face to face, one on one or even over the phone. And, and for a lot of those people, you might be the first person from outside of the home that they've they've seen for quite some time or, or someone they've talked to for quite some time. And so we're in a position to be able to, um, our radar sort of goes up and we think something's not quite right here. And so often it is stop smoking practitioners in the community who are the first people who witness um, suspected abuse in, in their clients going on. So that needs to be reported. So that's the purpose of this assessment task. Okay, so this is a case study. So uh, under the SSPP full program, assessment task eight, you will find the Dorothy case study. So you'll need to read the case study before you start. There's also an assessment task document that you will need to download. And also there is a handbook, the Career Force Guide, is there as well. So those are, are the documents that you'll need to be able to access uh, the information and to get started. So let's have a look at the assessment task, shall we? Or should we have a look at the website? The website, yeah, absolutely. Case study. Okay, yeah. so in terms of accessing the website or the actual document, oh, here we go, let's have a look at this. It's going to here. I'll be able to share. I'm just going to find the website. Which is here. We're going to go to um, nts.org.nz. It will open up as normal. And you'll go to the SSPP, you'll come down to full program, you will click there. And then you will scroll down to assessment task eight. So of course there's the introduction to the case study, there's a career force, the vulnerability and abuse learner guide. There's the helpful tips around abuse and neglect and the Ministry of Health recognizing abuse and neglect. We've got the case study right here and we've got the assessment task here. So in terms of the case study, It's probably good, like all the assessment tasks, is to actually read everything before you start. 
Okay, so with this, this is going to introduce you to Dorothy, and um, over the next few pages, you will have a good background on Dorothy, uh, what she does, who she's married to, who her children are, the types of things that are going on for Dorothy in her life. So uh, because it's a case study, everything you need to answer the questions are based on reading this case study and being familiar with um, Dorothy's life, really, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. So it's really a short story and it's about Dorothy um, wants to stop smoking and so you're going in there um, into her house and, and helping her to with her dependence on tobacco and over time you notice that things aren't quite right in her relationship with her husband. And so the, the case study gives you every, every little thing that you need to know to be able to answer the questions that are asked in the assessment task. So you can't actually answer the questions in the assessment task without reading the case study first. And you can see it's not that long. It's, I think it's about five or six pages hmm. and, and that's it. So you've got to read that first, otherwise you won't be able to do the assessment task. Right. So once you've had a look at that, then you'll be able to then uh, go to the assessment task. Have you probably look at the Career Force Learning Guide? So where will we find that? Actually, should we just go into the task? So make sure that you look at the Learning Guide. Well, let's have a look at the Learning Guide. And mm -hmm. we'll just give you an indication. Okay, I'll just share my screen and find our learning guide. Here we go. Let me go back to our website. So here we go, we're just getting the learning guide happening. Task eight, the uh, career force learning guide. Let's have a look at that. There we go. Okay, so um, this pretty much gives you a really good understanding of some of the reasons why some people in our communities are more vulnerable to, to abuse. Um, it talks about different sorts of abuse that can occur and it also talks about um, what you can do around reporting it, recording it, and then if you need to bring in third parties for an intervention, how you would go about doing that safely for the client, safely for you as the caseworker, and safely for your organisation. So but here's some factors that contribute to vulnerability. It's age and frailty as people get older they start losing their memory so they become more vulnerable for people stealing their money without them noticing or they rely on people to to um, do their shopping for them or their banking for them mm -hmm. and they're spending money without their knowledge right. or stealing um, and then isolation so people who are stuck in the house and they're controlling um, abuser won't let them have visitors or, or go out without permission or go out alone that they, they are more vulnerable to abuse because no one comes and sees this happening so there's all sorts of reasons why people become vulnerable right so then we've got some examples of different situations uh, where a person has a physical disability and or a communication impairment as a result of a stroke. So there are really good examples there in terms of what we're looking for. How does the situation make the person vulnerable? What are the possible consequences that might happen in that situation? And what can be done to ensure the safety of that person? So. Um, now, this is a really good learning guide. If you've been through a few of the other assessment tasks, you'll know how good the Career Force Learning Guides are and that we use them quite, uh, we use them a lot in terms of all the assessment tasks. We've got the different types of abuses here. They have been, they've got five commonly recognised forms of abuse, namely physical, sexual, emotional, financial abuse and neglect. So of course there are examples of you know what actually physical abuse is and then the types of abuse that and indicators around physical abuse and it goes through all of them so um, make sure you have a look at this guide 
was all put in good stead to uh and, and, it, and again that's all about learning so it's really good to to um know know this stuff and you don't have to spend long but just read this information so as i said earlier you might be the first person that this client has has seen from outside their home in, in a long time and so you've got the chance here to stop abuse escalating or continuing until until permanent injury or death occurs so it yeah. is really important to know this stuff there we go so in this case in this case that you want to meet dorothy uh, all dorothy's information is down here dorothy is Samoan, so um, you have to have a look at the perspective that it's coming from in terms of you know the cultural aspects of um, how someone person might be dealing with stress or in terms of you know maybe not wanting to talk about abuse because they might be embarrassed or you know their family so have a look through that and uh, put it into the perspective of Dorothy who is a Samoan. So now we're going to look at the actual case study. So you know, but like all of them that we've done before, make sure that uh, you read everything. You'll need to know um, how you would work with Dorothy, your case study client. Make sure you have a copy of the case study that you'll be looking at, in the Career Force Learning Guide. So there we go, it says here, Dorothy must be viewed as a Samoan client. So there we go, we can't reiterate, reiterate enough. Please read the case study information before you start that assessment task because it's going to make sure that it sets you up to be able to answer all the questions. In terms of section one grant, what are we looking at? So these are just questions about, because remember in the case study, um, you're there to help Dorothy stop smoking. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the questions around her smoking. How many does she smoke? How many times does she relapse? What caused the relapse? Um, what withdrawal symptoms has she done? And stuff like that. So pretty straightforward. Yeah, so you know what, and there's an example at the top here that you can follow in terms of triggers. So uh, it's not, it shouldn't be too difficult. If you get stuck anywhere along the way, and you've always got access to Grant or myself, so feel free to send us a text or um, email us. Our details are on our NTS website. So all of these things, you will find the answers to those when you read through the case study itself. And then we'll come into section three, which is all about um, some of Dorothy's mental health issues in terms of her depression, her sister has bipolar, and, you know, so in terms of when you're um, trying to work out a care plan, that's sort of things that you would need to consider. Look, you need to start thinking about the things that affect the mental health of Dorothy or her sister. So if we have a look down here, we'll be asking you to give examples as they relate to Dorothy. So, um, you know, there's a factor of how that might strengthen the way Dorothy manages stressful events, or in this case on the right-hand side, um, how factors could make Dorothy more vulnerable to stressful events. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And they're all just various things. If you're really looking at, you know, your complete well-being in terms of the environment, the social group she hangs out with, her physical fitness, her body health, budget, finance, which are all things we know can affect the outcomes for people who stop smoking, if and when they stop smoking. This is in and around, you know, her levels of physical activity, the type of foods that she eats. Uh, in terms of improving your well-being, mental health well-being. So some of the answers we're looking for there is um, if people just do light, regular exercise, uh, the activity increases um, feel-good chemicals in your brain, so uh, endorphins, and um, that can improve your, your mood, your level of stress, so your levels of stress. So just getting a bit of regular exercise can really, really benefit your mental well-being. So that's a simple answer. You might have to do a little bit of research if you're not familiar with this, um, the effects of exercise and diet on mental health, but that's fine too. We're not looking for thousands of words here, just simple sentences that answer the question. There we go. Great. So, you know, just in terms of, you know, how could reducing, avoiding drugs or alcohol improve someone's mental health or mental health, health and well-being? Well, that shouldn't be too difficult to answer. 
section five. Um, this is, isn't just about Dorothy. This is about any person that you might know, not just Dorothy, who might be vulnerable to abuse or harm. So describe how vulnerable people who use the health and disability services might be at risk to different types of abuse. So for instance, um, if we look at num um, B here, for any person who, for any person, how can lack of natural support increase the likelihood of abuse or harm? So natural support is people who are you know, members of the family or friends or acquaintances or neighbours who pop into the house regularly. Most of us, we're always having visitors come to see us or we're going to see other people. People who are isolated, they might be isolated by a controlling person in their life. So they're not allowed outside, they're not allowed to have any visitors. Um, they're not allowed to use a phone. All these things occur in our community. So they have no natural support. So that's the meaning of natural support. There's no one coming to see them. And so because they're alone, if there's abuse occurring, no one sees it, and so it continues and often escalates. Right. So this is also a continuation of questions around vulnerability. But, you know, that can be about anyone you know, not specifically Dorothy, but anyone in the community. So the following types of vulnerability who could be more at risk to potential harm or uh, abuse. So, yeah, so if you look at number um, B again, emotional, and um, people are emotionally vulnerable. So that might be a result of them um, being told their whole lives they're useless or stupid or a waste of space or a burden on the family or no good to anyone. And, and that's they're getting emotional abuse and they come to believe this and they come to think it's normal mm -hmm. and therefore they, um, they don't do anything about it. And they, so they get into self-hatred and self-blame and, and they think they deserve the abuse right. because they are so hopeless. Here's another example of emotional abuse could be, um, you know, if you see sort of somebody's blackmailing them or they're scared about them or they're threatening them. So they might not be actually physically, you know, smacking them about, but they could be threatening them all the time. They, if you don't do this, I'm going to do this to you, which sort of puts them in an emotional, vulnerable position because they start to be fearful and they start to not be able to be in control of their emotions because of the fear that's been created by somebody in their lives. So number seven is really important. It's, it's um, back to Dorothy. Back to Dorothy. So in your, in your role as health professionals, you might notice indicators of abuse and you might suspect abuse. But this, this series of questions are asking you, how do you report on that? What actions do you take within your, within your role and under the policy of your organisation to make sure that the the abuse is the indicators are real, that, that, that your client is being abused or people in the house are being abused, so that there's real concrete evidence in case that case comes to a court of law. You need to have evidence in place. So that's what we're looking for here. It's what do you do under your policies of your workplace that allows you to report on suspected abuse cases to mm. keep everybody safe. Okay. So if we're looking at A, describe how you would support Dorothy during that period of time and how you would maintain your respect in terms of privacy, dignity, autonomy. Uh, D, describe two indicators or signs of sexual abuse from your case study or from your own personal knowledge and experience. So you know, we just want two there. Two examples, there's another two examples of indicators of sign or physical abuse from a case study or knowledge. So, you know, if we're, you might see some um, bruises on their arms that, uh, or some, you know, that you could see maybe they might have a black eye. You ask them about it and they say they walk into a door, but actually you've got a feeling because there's lots of other holes maybe in the wall that actually somebody's been punching holes in there. So, you know, it's a physical indicator that somebody could be being abused. Signs of emotional abuse, people might be nervous and fearful, they want to get you out of the house as soon as possible because they're nervous that, you know, the person that's sickening them is coming home. So often, you know, you know, when you're asking them, you know that something's not right, but they're telling you, yes, everything's okay, but you know, 
in telling the boards or the way the eyes are, or is it just uh, you know that there's something not quite right? So a couple of uh, indicators for each of those areas. And then we've got another two for financial abuse, describing effects of long-term abuse. So um, all of these things you'll be able to get the answers from either the case study or from your own experience. Now this question here, um, number 10, sorry, Edward, number oh, 10, sorry. it causes some people a bit of difficulty. So when people, what, what this question is asking you is, is what happens to the way that a person's mental health medicines and some other medicines are metabolized in the person's body if the person yeah. suddenly stops smoking? And why is it important for them to be seen by their doctor through the stages of quitting? So when people stop smoking, certain things occur within their body from actually stopping smoking. And there's four medicines that are affected by the changes that occur. So liver function slows down and some of these medicines the level of them rises within the bloodstream and it can become dangerous. So that's what the question is asking you. How does that happen? To find out the answer, Edward's going to show you where you can get that. Okay, so you can go onto our website and you can go to the resources. So it's pretty straightforward. You know our, our website. Um, you should know it pretty well by now. But under the resources, you'll come across this book here. This is a resource that you can download and then you can look at it online. And it's the NTS Handbook for Tobacco Dependence and Withdrawal. Okay, so if you don't have a copy of this handy, you can just go to the resources page on the NTS website. You can get that. And if you go to page 11 in this resource, here is a section on changes in drug metabolism. So this changes in drug metabolism will have the four different medicines. Uh, that may or may that may change. So this is where you're going to find the answers for question number 10. NTS Handbook for Tobacco Withdrawal, Dependence and Withdrawal, which you'll find on our website. Excellent. And I think that's pretty much it. Well, yes. So um, that is it, really. We've gone through everything that we need to talk to you about. Just uh, let's have a look here. Oh, here we go. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. If you get stuck with anything, then yeah, you're more than welcome to get hold of us and uh, ask us the questions. We're here and happy to help you. So uh, probably finally, just my one good piece of advice would be, before we get started, download the assessment task, or before you get started, download all those resources and read them. Have the assessment task ready. And when you watch this video clip, when you watch this tutorial, you'll be able to give me some handy pointers as you're going through the assessment. Okay, can I go home now? You can go home now. Thank you, Tiano. We'll see you next assessment task.